When I was a boy, I was told that America, we always called America, not United States of America. Most of the Europe, most of the world still calls this country as America, except the people in South America. We are not Americanos because they are Americans or, or gringos. Even Canadians call us Americans and they are Canadians. That's the difference. <laughs> when I was a child, I was told that American streets and the whole country was paved with gold. And skyscrapers were everywhere. And skyscrapers always symbolized America. I remember my sister's wedding. I was nine years old. Children at a wedding receive candy. Candy is rare. Uh, for very special occasions, people had to go to big cities to buy candy. The candy I received was wrapped in a paper and it had a picture in the candy colors. There was a skyscraper, airplane flying over it, underneath an ocean liner. And uh, the writing was the 20th century. And for us, meant America. I wish I had saved these wrappers. Today they, would, they are collectibles, I presume. I could be rich. I wouldn't have to teach at Bard College. My uncle, on the day I was taken to Germany, said to me, if you ever have a chance to go to America, don't go. Because America has no soul. He said that. I didn't know what he meant by that. He was a cultural man, educated in Switzerland. His roommate at the university there was Spengler. Anyone remembers, recognizes the name of Oswald Spengler? The man who wrote Der Untergang des Abendlandes, in translation, The Downfall of Western Civilization. That's where the soul business was coming from Spengler. If you read Spengler, and, and I have read him, you still don't know what the hell he was talking about. He didn't know the difference between Scheisse and, and soul. <laughs> Trivia, it took me six months to read it to him, the whole Spengler. He wrote a lot. I still don't know what the hell he was writing about. I read all the Germans, Kant, Schopenhauer, Hegel, Heidegger, and the goddamn Nietzsche. That's a heavy stuff to read. German philosophers, they are heavy. Das Dasein, figure that one out if you know German. If you know German, you still can't figure that one out. By that time, I had it. It was time to leave this country of philosophers, butchers, and killers. I couldn't stand German language. I couldn't stand that the sound of German language anymore. And their songs, leader, they called them appropriate. How can you sing in German? 
Verfluchte Schweinerei! Immer hack dem Hub der Jagdung! In, in, imagine in Italian the words fall off your lips. Mamma son tanto felice. That's singing. Not la la la. I couldn't take that. I had to get out of Germany. I was living in a camp uh, around by the United Nations, which was known as a DP camp, displaced persons camp, a camp for people who have no place to go back home. Displaced persons. Our food consisted basically of powdered eggs. Uh, they came in a can. Uh, you open it and uh, you add water to it, you stir it, and um, then we use, use the, the can tops that you open uh, as our frying pans, and you put them on, on some kind of a heat, and um, uh, you eat it. It's hard, you could carry in your pocket these pancakes made out of uh, dried, uh, egg powder that tasted awful. We were told that that's very good for your health and has many vitamins and nourishment. So we ate <laughs> because there was nothing much else to do. But we had spam. <laughs> spam we had. They would hand them out left and right and in cans, small cans, big cans. and. Um, and we would be sitting, eating this spam. We liked it very much. And, uh, and uh, we would ask each other, what is this? <laughs> what are we eating? <laughs> Mysteries of life, I presume. I was losing hair. My teeth were falling out. And I was still hungry. Trivia. My dentist in New York, Dr. Schneider, sent two of his beautiful daughters to private colleges, and I paid for them. Thank you. I never get a thank you from him, but he saved my rotten teeth. Around that time, I was still in Germany. Uh, Israel nation was being formed by various mandates, United Nations mandates. The first thing when I heard about Israel nation being formed, Byron came to my mind. You know the poet, Lord Byron, who at the turn of the century went to Greece to help Greeks to form their own nation. And I thought, that's great. I was still very, very idealistic. And I said, I'll do what Byron did. I'll go to Israel and help Israel to form its own nation. Ah, romantics of this world unite. I went to the Israel Commission for an interview, and the interview lasted about five seconds. Uh, the question was, are you Jewish? I said, no. Said, Next. That was it. That was end of my baronesque idealism. <laughs> I still resisted, resisted the United States remembering what my uncle said, what Spengler said about the soul. I tried Canada, no go. Australia, no go. And then the wolf was outside my door, the wolf of hunger. And I could hear the teeth going at night, hoping for a bone meal in the morning. So to stay away from this 
wolf of hunger uh, had to get out. And some fools in Chicago, religious fools, by the way, uh, made out papers for myself and my brother to be admitted into the United States. Sponsors' papers. We said, oh, what the heck? We are too hungry here. Let's see what this country without a soul can do for us. So United Nations put us on a U.S. military transport ship. And um, one cloudy, rainy October morning, we arrived at the west side docks in New York City. A member of that religious group that sponsored our arrival here gave each of us $10 and uh, good luck in this beautiful country. Luckily, a friend of ours who came to the States six months earlier came to meet us. We had $10 each, myself and my brother, but we had uh, six boxes of books with us. So we had to hire a driver to transport our books to Brooklyn and we paid $6 each to the driver. So we ended up with $4 each. And uh, that night we slept in Brooklyn on the floor in a sub-basement apartment. Uh, that was my first night in America where the streets were paved in gold. In the morning when I woke up, my friend was gone. He went to the Sunshine Biscuit Factory in Queens where he worked and where he ruined his health. In those days, we are talking 1949. There was no health insurance for the workers. There was nothing yet. So his health was ruined. So I woke up in this sub-basement apartment, looked out the window, and I see in big letters right in front of me, Hemingway, 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 written big, big letters, five feet tall. I said, wow, I'm in the country of Hemingway. This is great. And then I realized that my window overlooked a Hemingway moving parking lot that was a moving truck, Hemingway moving trucks in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So I lost another moment of my innocence there. <coughs> there I was in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which is Calcutta of Brooklyn. Streets were lined with garbage and filth and ugliness everywhere. I have never seen so much ugliness I have seen in Brooklyn that year. I used to say later, ugly like Hoboken, but only Brooklyn can be ugly. Today, instead of saying that something is ugly, I would say, it's just like Brooklyn. Today, the houses, even the streets, and most of the Williamsburg, where I spent my first year in the States, it's not there anymore, gone. Brooklyn Queens Expressway runs over most of these streets I lived in. On the South Fifth Street, there was a small cemetery 
There is no South Fifth Street anymore. BQE is running over it, Brooklyn, Queens Expressway, BQE. And in, during the rush hours, they still rattle their bones underneath them. There is no peace in Brooklyn, even when you are dead. Then the, from there on, it was all downhill. That, then that $10, which was $4 after the trucker took six, didn't last very long. No job, no place to stay. What do you do? I felt like one of those characters in Chaplin movies about the immigrants, especially the one where he plays the immigrant. What do you do? No friends and no income. What do you do when you are poor in America? You do nothing. My first job lasted two weeks. I, was, I worked in a plastic wallet factory, they, you know, it's a sweatshop. They used to make these little things that you carry, uh, your uh, things, like these are plastic things you open up. That's St. Tula's picture, actually, kind of, yeah. You carry all these things. So I used to work in this, it's not a factory, it was a sweatshop. Only about six of us were there. And I, I worked on this machine, you, <coughs> you put it on, you press it, and it seals the edges, so three edges, so you could put your St. Tula's picture in it. Uh, uh, I work 12 hours a day, six days a week, no break for lunch. So I used to carry two Hershey bars, and uh, that was my lunch. After two weeks, uh, I felt like volunteering going back to those camps in Germany. I felt this is, I felt there's no future here, no end, nothing in front of me anymore. Is this America of my dreams? I wondered. Where are the skyscrapers and ocean liners? So I got a dishwasher's job in Brooklyn. Uh, that was better. I worked seven days a week, 12 hours, but I, I could eat all the leftovers. So I didn't have to pay for food. That was good. Uh, and um, I took home about $20 a week. And also this was under the table, that was great, no taxes. I worked on Sundays also, so that means uh, I couldn't go to the movies. Uh, then business in the luncheonette was slow and I was downsized, I think it's called now, but uh, at that time I felt I was fired. Uh, uh, so it took me about another month to find another job uh, in a castor convertible sofa factory in Queens. Uh, together, I took subway, a bus, and then walked about 10 blocks, then back the same way. And uh, I was still hungry. My first two years in the States, I remember as being constantly hungry. That's the time when I started to steal. Shoplifting is a sort of a designer word. What I did, I did steal food. Stealing is much more real word, what you are doing. Shoplifting is no good. It doesn't have that powerful criminal connotation, shoplifting, that stealing. I stole from the neighborhood stores. Uh, there were no supermarkets yet in the States or any place in the world. Uh, supermarkets are very easy targets now. Uh, 
I didn't steal from the rich or to get rich. I just stole whatever was not nailed down. And I felt this is the way to survive in, in the States. First, I stole because of necessity. It became a habit with me. Also, I was good. <laughs> I'm still good at it. <laughs> uh, uh, today, I don't have to steal, but I do steal. Uh, just to stay in practice in case I do have to steal. Uh, Now we have these disposable razors. Before that, they used those you deck the razors, and they come in very small packages. And I have never paid for a single one for all my life. <laughs> They're easy, so easy. They just disappear. I love kippers. You know those those long alligator cans. They're so, they are so well designed. They just. I just got him last week, actually, at IGA in Red Hook. <laughs> I did it. I swear, cross my heart. I do it all the time. And, uh, uh, and uh, pants? <laughs> do you pay for that? In the bookstore, you pay for that? <laughs> oh, don't be fools. Uh, this, the new bookstore is more difficult. The old one in the, that stone row here was much better. There were little nooks and no, n nobody paid any attention. They almost invited you to. Um, I was never caught. Uh, I remember years back, uh, a friend who had a car, we went to New Jersey, Route 86, or 80, 22nd, I don't remember, uh, a store called Two Guys, the clothing store. And I'm very proud of this. I stole the whole suit. <laughs> I stuffed into my pants. I don't know how I, I must have looked awful, but it was one of these, um, like, they looked like a snake skin, but it was all synthetic, you know, the stuff that uh, the bugs don't eat. So it was a great, I had it for years and years. It was a great suit. I walked out with it. And uh, uh, also, years later, actually I, I worked at Bard already at that time. Uh, I stole a complete suit at Macy's in New York. I just walked in, I changed right there. Nothing even in the changing booth. B -b -behind, behind those, I walked out. My heart was beating hard because this, this, this was dangerous. It, and it was uh, the Good Friday. So I said, oh, Jesus is watching over me. This will be all right. <laughs> it, it, it was a fine. Um, I used to quote Marx, and now today it's um, not fashionable. Uh, Marx used to say, redistribution of wealth. Um, I used to call acquisition, but, um, but I still like the original definition, stealing. There's nothing wrong with the word. So, uh, shoplifting is too easy. We all, you do all the time. Uh, when Europe and Asia were burying their dead, when the entire countries were in ruin, <coughs> when I came to the United States, I found the cultural scene close to zero. In theater, the only thing that remains from those couple of years is the glass menagerie. In books, nothing. Even Pulitzer refused to give a prize that year because there was nothing worthwhile being published. Not a single song remains from that time except the stupid, let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. <laughs> Films didn't do any better, except the National Velvet, Elizabeth's favorite movie. That's all. Uh, what else happened that year when I came? Ezra Pound was indicted four years earlier and convicted for treason. 
for broadcasting Nazi propaganda from the uh, radio station in Roma. Instead of death penalty, he was committed to a mental institution in Washington, D.C., institution for criminally insane. Ezra Pound, Pound, being a poet, I think that saved his life. Everybody knows that poets are insane. We have few of them at Bard that teach here, too. Imagine a poet applying for a truck driver's job at Hemingway. Please. So, so who are you? What have you done? So I'm a poet. So, yeah. like, I just killed my grandmother, my children. Get out of here. Nobody will hire a poet. They are crazy. <laughs> you know they are crazy. I remember about um, uh, four years after I came to the States, um, myself, my brother, and uh, another colleague who were going to make a film about um, William Carlos Williams, the poet, but he was, wasn't crazy. Uh, uh, he was actually Ezra Pound's physician, or Ezra Pound was in his trust while he can leave the uh, this mentally insane institution in Washington and be chaperoned by Williams Carlos Williams, the poet. Uh, uh, this is from my diary. Quote, I walked into William Carlos Williams' kitchen. There he sat, a scraggly, unshaven, ancient-looking, staring silently into an empty coffee cup, pale eyes, not blinking, a shadow of a man, neither hello nor goodbye, got a rise out of him, Ezra Pound. He looked as insane as any poet I knew. End of entry. Last summer in Italy, in Rapallo, we were sailing on a nice boat that belonged to Ezra Pound's doctor in Italy, Dr. Bacci Calupo. His son pointed out to me the villa where Ezra Pound lived, up there overlooking the Mediterranean blue waters. I keep running into Ezra Pound's doctors somehow, even when we went to visit his grave in Venice. An Italian doctor took me there, but he was a doctor of literature. We won't see any more war movies or blood and gore or more killings. From now on, I think we should have fun. For you to know me better, I'll show a 60-minute film, documentary film, going, called Going Home. It is a very personal film. Uh, I should say perhaps something about it. Uh, when I left Lithuania and was in German, labor camp. Uh, Soviet Russia reoccupied my country, and uh, <clears throat> I was persona non grata. But according to their law, I was still a Russian citizen. Then after like 20 years in the States, and myself and my brother, when we became famous uh, through film and through other work, they wanted very, very badly to bring us back to Russians, wanted to bring us back to showcase us in Soviet Union. That was still Soviet Union. And uh, we resisted because we were afraid. We could be sent to Siberia for 10 different reasons, draft evasion, anything. 
for leaving the country illegally. So we negotiated for about five years with the, the Russian embassy in New York. New York. Uh, it felt that we are doing in good faith, but uh, <laughs> who knows, uh, nothing in the writing. So we negotiated three conditions that we'll take our cameras with us and we'll shoot anything we want, but we will not shoot any military installations, so don't worry about that. We are not interested. And that we'll take the film out unprocessed because we couldn't trust their processing, also we might lose the film. And that we could go any place we want to go without any interference except military installations. And that we leave the country safely with all our possessions. So they agreed to that. And under those conditions, myself, my brother, my wife, we went to Soviet Russia and to my country, Lithuania, to visit my mother and my brothers, who were still there at that time. And uh, this is a record of that visit. This was a home movie, shot in 16 millimeter film, was never intended to be shown publicly. When we got back, New York Film Festival people find out that we have footage. I kept it for a year, not touching, not doing anything. I said, there's no film in it, this is just a memory. Then they went after us, myself and my brother, I said, edit it and we want to have it in the New York Film Festival. So I had a very, very short time, like a month perhaps, to put it together. And this is the result of what I did. And uh, to place my, perhaps myself in a better perspective, I would add also that I moved quite a lot in this world from one country to another, to another, to another. I had to change my language several times. And I felt that I didn't know where I belong anymore. Growing up on a farm, it was very simple. There I stood, this is where I'm standing, and where whatever I look around, that's what I see, that's the world around me. I'm in the center of it. Today, when I travel, I don't know where the center of the world is anymore. I could easily move my center to Tivoli, Denmark, Tivoli, Italy, or Tivoli in New York. So I decided that from now on, I'll be the center of my world. Where I put my foot down, this is it. I'm it. Because all these years, I could not stop moving. I could not put roots any place. I let the world turn around me. Because I would like to be able to measure the distances from myself to other places in the world, something like 200 miles, or Boston, 200 mi 100 miles to New York, four to 300 miles to Rome, Italy, 8,000 miles to Alice Springs, Australia, and three miles to Tivoli, and zero miles home. So we'll see the film. But before I see the film, I'll just remember something here. Uh, 
I cleaned my uh, bags, my boxes, and I found a few things that I still had from Germany. And I would like to share them with you. Uh, here's some stands for you. <laughs> Pass it around. Stand. Who wants stand? <laughs> Pass it around, pass it around. I, I won't throw this too heavy on my finger. Uh, all right, more, more. Anybody else? Who wants? Pass it on the back there. There are two uh, passes in the back. Another pass it in the back. There are two hands. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, 